I have a mind this morning to read some scripture to you from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life, many suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, give fervent, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. This letter the Apostle Peter wrote was to a group of people that were suffering greatly for their Christian faith. They were suffering uh, physically. They were suffering physical persecution. They were suffering in many ways. And if we go back to chapter 1 and verse 1, let's notice what the Apostle Peter said about the people that he's writing this letter to. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, not strangers to God, but strangers to this world, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That region is what we would know today as Asia Minor. And when the Apostle Peter was writing this letter, he was writing it to Christians who were following Jesus, and they were being persecuted, and they were being scattered throughout this large geographical region. Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. It would be like today, if, if maybe I could give an illustration, if, if, if persecution came to Alabama for our Christian faith, and we either had to give up our Christian profession or we had to flee for protection and had to go to Mexico or Central America or South America, and you had to leave behind your houses, your jobs, your families, that would be hard, wouldn't it? It would for me. It would be for all of us. And that's the situation that these early Christians are in. Sometimes I think we too quickly forget what our brothers and sisters in Christ suffered during the first century. There were many martyrs, many people suffering. And the Apostle Paul, before God dealt with him by sovereign grace, was also per persecuting the church. I want to notice with you in Acts 26 <clears throat> what the Apostle Paul said about himself. Beginning in verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, 
Listen to that. He put many people in prison, being received, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So there were many Christians who were being put to death in the first century for their Christian faith. Now you and I have been blessed, haven't we, to live in a land where we have religious freedom and we praise God and thank God for that. But we don't need to forget, beloved, what people before us have gone through for their Christian profession. If you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, it gives you an insight into what many people in Europe suffered in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries for their profession of faith. So Peter is writing this letter to people that have been scattered, driven away from their homeland, and they are suffering for Jesus' sake. So he says to them in chapter 4, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, and he did. Jesus Christ came to this earth to live among men and to be the sin bearer, and he suffered in the flesh. When he was born, he was born in a barn. Joseph and Mary had to take him into Egypt for a while because you remember Herod had ordered that all the children, certain age and under, be killed. So Jesus was suffering as a little baby, having to flee into Egypt. As a young boy, he suffered. As a young man, he suffered many things. And finally, he suffered the death of the cross. <clears throat> now, here are his followers who are suffering for their Christian faith, for their faith in Jesus. So Peter is saying to them, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Now what is, what is the Apostle Peter saying here? He is saying that the Christian life involves warfare. And if you're going to be involved in a war, you need to be armed. Don't you? You need, you need to arm yourselves. Listen to what he says. Arm yourselves. Likewise, with the same mind. Beloved, if you want to follow Jesus Christ, even in this land where we have so much religious freedom, that doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer for Jesus' sake. If you live a Christian life in America today, you are going to suffer some, to some degree. If you're really suffer, if you're really living a Christian life. So you need to arm yourselves for spiritual warfare. And the best way to arm yourself is to have the mind that Jesus had. In all of the suffering that Jesus went through, there is not one time that he ever complained about anything. He didn't murmur. He didn't say, why me? No, he had the mind of one that was willing to suffer for a right cause. So the apostle is saying to us, we need to arm ourselves. Uh, the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And you and I have got to fight the world around us, which is certainly anti-Christian. We've got to deal with our own fleshly nature, which is prone to sin, given to sin, bent toward evil, and... We've got to fight the devil, who is a very cunning and formidable foe. This is warfare. Now, I feel safe here this morning. I hope all of you feel safe in this house. I do. I, I believe I'm surrounded with people that love me and love the Lord and love one another. And we just come over here and have a good time on Sunday morning. We're at peace one with the other. But let me tell you, out there in the world, it is spiritual warfare. And you and I need to be armed in our minds for the spiritual warfare. 
So he would say, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he hath suffered in the flesh, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now what is the apostle saying there? He's saying that if you are suffering today because of your Christian life, you know what that means? That means that you have given up a life of sin. That doesn't mean that you're sinless. We're all going to be sinners until the day we die. But we have given up those habitual sins that we used to be involved in. And now, because of that, we are suffering for Jesus' sake. And I like what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I'm not even worthy to suffer for Jesus. Wasn't that a great attitude to have? I'm not even worthy to suffer for Jesus. And here is a man that was stoned in Lystra. They put him in a stone pit and stoned him and thought he was dead when they left. They beat him many times with stripes and rods. He was shipwrecked. He was in prison. This man suffered greatly. He suffered famine. He suffered many hardships in life. And yet, notice what the apostle says. For I reckon, listen to this now, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Here is a man that suffered more than you and I have ever imagined to suffer for Jesus' sake. I've often said if I ever spent one night in jail for preaching the gospel, I'd work it into every sermon. <laughs> I'd remind y'all, I suffered for Jesus. I spent a night in jail. Look what this man went through. And yet he said, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to what? With the glory that shall be revealed in us. So God's suffering saints on this earth, living a Christian life and going opposite the world, they need to keep their eyes on the glory that's coming. Would you all agree with that today? So the Apostle Peter is saying that if you're living for Jesus, you're going to uh, suffer, but you have ceased from your habitual sins. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh. Now that statement right there, I want to really try to emphasize this morning where the apostle said the rest of his time, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Listen to what the apostle says, the rest of his time. If you're a child of God on this earth and you've been saved by grace, you have been given some time to live on this earth. Now, none of us know how long we have left. None of us do. Yesterday at the graduation, I enjoyed a talk that uh, one of the girls in the class made, and she was talking about our legacy, and, and, uh, and she quoted Alexander Hamilton, and, and his thought about a legacy was, it was like planting seeds in a garden that you never lived to see flourish. You and I are going to leave behind a legacy. What legacy will we leave behind? That's a good thought for us to ponder this morning. And the rest of the time that we have on this earth is valuable if we live it to the glory of God. None of us know how long we have left. Uh, the Bible says, what is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We may have a day left. We may have 25, 30, 60, 70 years left. But whatever time you have left, the apostle is saying the rest of your time on this earth is a gift from God. Do you know where time comes from? It comes from God. You can't go to the drugstore and buy some time. You can't go to Walmart and buy some time. All the time we have is a gift from God. And that time that God gives us is not to be wasted in the flesh. 
Notice what the apostle says. That he no longer should live the rest of his time to the fle- in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Wouldn't that be something if all of us determined this day, from this day forward, whatever time I have left, whether it's one day, one minute, or 75 years, I'm going to live it to the will of God. I'm going to try to please my God who loved me and suffered for me on the cross. Oh, beloved, you and I should never take lightly the sufferings of our Savior at Calvary. And out of a sense of gratitude for his suffering on the cross, we now should live the rest of our time uh, not in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Peter is saying that these people he's writing to at one time were living after the flesh. And they were following the flesh and doing things that Satan wanted them to do. Now verse 4, Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Peter says, when you give up that life out there in the world and you quit frolicking and drinking and banqueting with the world and following abominable idolatries, they're going to think you're a strange person. (laughs) And listen, where you work and where you go to school, if the people out there living in the flesh, living just for the flesh, if they don't think you're strange, you probably need to change your lifestyle. Amen? That's very true. I love the story of the young woman who at one time had been a party girl and she, everybody wanted her to come to their wild parties because she was the life of the party. She was wild and promiscuous and sinful. But God's grace began to work in her life and God opened her eyes to see how horrible sin was and she committed her life to the Lord Jesus. And one day she was invited to a party by an old friend. And uh, the old friend said, we need you here. You're the life for the party. And she wrote a letter back and said, I can't attend, I'm dead. <laughs> now that was a puzzle, of course, to her old friend. But to us who have died to this world, it's not a, it's not a puzzle. Notice what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, he would say, beginning in verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, if you've been born again, if you've been raised up with the power of the Holy Spirit, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Get your mind out of the cesspool. Life is hard enough, beloved, if you're following Jesus. But if you turn your mind over to the world, the flesh, and the devil, I can promise you it's going to be a lot worse. Following Jesus is hard, but following the flesh is much harder. So Paul would say, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Paul is saying you died to that old life, to that old world. Now, a child of God who has died to it can still go out there and participate in it, but you won't enjoy it. I promise you that. Yeah, the Holy Spirit will not allow you to enjoy those sins. And so the Apostle Peter is saying, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. When the Lord dealt with me when I was about 14 years old, I had been in bad company. I'm not going to elaborate on that, but... I have friends in Georgia who would be glad to tell you what a rascal I was before God's grace came into my life. I'm ashamed of that, truly ashamed of that life that I was living. But when the Lord came 
into my heart and began to teach me about himself and about my sins. I can tell you I was convicted. And I began to die to those habits. I lost a lot of my vocabulary. <laughs> Anybody in the house today ever lost a lot of your vocabulary when you started following Jesus? And I, I remember when I joined the church and I uh, began to try to behave myself, I would sit alone in the dining room at school, the lunch room, by myself. Because my old buddies that I used to run with and was very good friends with, they didn't want me around anymore. Because they couldn't tell their jokes and use their profanity. And I was just a party pooper. <laughs> and you know, it takes courage. It takes courage to live a Christian conviction in this world. Reminds me of the young boy that was on a college campus and he carried his Bible with him everywhere. And one day a bully was laughing at him and mocking him and saying, you're just a silly Christian. You're just a little effeminate, silly Christian carrying your Bible around. <laughs> and you know what that young Christian boy did? He handed his Bible to his bully and said, do you have enough courage to carry this book on campus for one day? Did y'all get that? Do I need to repeat that? <laughs> it takes courage to live a Christian life on a college campus. On a high school campus, it takes courage to live a Christian life in many of the offices and factories of this day. But oh, my beloved friends, if you're suffering for Jesus' sake, you are blessed and you shouldn't murmur and complain about it. People will look at you and think you strange, and that's okay. There are people out there in the world, I don't want them to look at me and think, oh, Sam's normal, he's, he's okay, he's cool. I don't want people in the world who are following the flesh, the world, and the devil to think that I'm cool. I want to try to live in a way that would show them a better way. Would you all agree with that this morning? Why not? Let me tell what I'm saying to you all this morning is whatever Jesus Christ tells us not to do, we're better off not doing it. And whatever he tells us to do, we're better off doing it. And I want to tell you, whatever Jesus has taught us to do, if we follow in his steps, we will be blessed. I've known many, many people in my lifetime, and I've yet to run into one person who ever followed Jesus, who ever joined the church and followed Jesus, who regretted it. Never have. But I've known a lot of people that didn't, that regretted it. One of my, one of my best friends in school, uh, I loved him. He was a very... He was a very talented athlete. I, I think he probably could have played in the minor leagues at least, maybe the majors. He was a very fine athlete. But he was given to alcohol, and he turned his life over to alcohol. And finally, he was in a hospital in Warner Robins, Georgia, dying. And his wife, his ex-wife, he, he had married, I think, the prettiest girl in our class. But she couldn't live with him because of his alcoholism. But she called me up and said, Sam, would you go visit Ronnie? He's dying. And I went to see him. And his stomach was swollen from cirrhosis of the liver. And I didn't even recognize him. Let me tell you, beloved. And Ronnie welcomed me into his room and wanted me to pray for him and with him. And I was glad to do that. And I, I'm sure he's one of God's children. And he'll be in glory by the grace of God, just like you and I will. But he lived in torment on this earth. Sin is very expensive, folks. It'll take you further than you ever intended to go. It'll keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it'll cost you a lot more than you ever intended to pay. Are you listening? I know the world out there is advertising its goods. On television, in the movies, in the magazines, on the internet. I understand it's out there advertising sin all the time. And it makes it look very good. But let me tell you, Satan has got a hook in all of it. James talks about the hook Satan has. You know, I'm not much of a fisherman, but I know enough about fishing to know you don't go fishing with an empty hook. 
You put something on that hook, the, the fish won't. You put a worm or a cricket or something on there, and that attracts the fish, and he bites, and then the fisherman jerks, and the fish is caught. Satan knows how to bait his hooks. Are you all getting this? Just because something sounds good, feels good, tastes good, looks good, is exciting, doesn't mean that it's according to the Word of God. And so Satan has got his hook in a lot of God's children in this world today. And Ronnie, my dear friend, regretted a life given over to alcohol, gave up such a wonderful life for alcohol and drugs. And, and beloved, may God help us today to live in such a way that Satan is not deceiving us. Be not deceived, the Bible says. Now, let's come on down to our text here uh, in verse 5, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. It's God that does the judging. You and I are not judges. It's God that judges. You and I are to be witnesses. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Notice the tense of the word was. It was preached, the gospel was preached in the past to those that are now physically dead. Many of the saints had died for their Christian faith, but the gospel had been preached to them that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. I love that. Now let's come to verse 7. But the, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. He's talking to us about the coming of the Lord Jesus, and that is the brightest star in the Christian sky today. The promise that some morning, Jesus, or some night, he's going to part the heavens and descend with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ arise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet the Lord in the air. What a day that will be, and that's what we're looking forward to, isn't it? Nothing on our calendars we wouldn't be glad to cancel right now if Jesus comes back today. So the apostle says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch, what? Unto prayer. Don't be troubled, don't be anxious, don't be filled with anxiety, but watch unto prayer. The last time I was here, Sister Carol Williams came up to me after church and said that she had spent the night with her dad, who uh, is feeble, and she had rushed to come to church here that morning, and she was, she was, when she got in the car and got down the road, she thought she had left something at her dad's house, and she was really troubled about it, didn't want to be late for church, pulled into a church parking lot, I guess, to turn around, and she saw a sign on the church marquee that said, Jesus said, calm down. <laughs> it was good timing, wasn't it, Sister Carol? Jesus said, calm down. How many of us need to have that on our mirror every morning where we go to wash our face? Jesus said, calm down. How can I calm down in this crazy world? With prayer? It's hard to be full of anxiety when you're praying to a God of all grace. You hadn't tried it? I, don't, I want you to try it. <laughs> Jesus said, calm down. So the apostle says, watch unto prayer and above all things. Now let's see what is above everything else that he's been teaching here. What is at the top of the list? What's the crowning jewel of all these lessons? And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I love that. Above everything else, Peter is saying charity is the main thing in our lives. It's good to arm your minds for spiritual warfare. It's very important that we do that. All of these things that he's been teaching us are very important 
that we do if we're going to try to live for our Lord Jesus in this world. But above everything, we need to have fervent charity among yourselves. That word fervent is an interesting word. And I connect it with, with Olympic athletes because it was used in Greece and the Greeks, I think, invented the Olympic Games. And they used that word fervent to describe an athlete who was really working, training hard to be the best he can be. He was training fervently. How many of y'all like to go to a ball game and the players out there are not even energetic? How would you like to go to a football game and the players out there act like they couldn't care less whether they win or not? How would y'all like that? You'd probably just get up and leave. You ever seen a batter go to the home plate and he's not even interested in trying to hit the ball? It's just one, two, three, and I'm out and that's good. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to watch a ball team playing with that attitude. You'd want a pitcher to hit him, maybe wake him up. You want ball players to be fervently involved in the sport. Is that right? Come on now. I'm in Alabama. I know you all are sports enthusiasts. You love to see people who are out there to win. Well, P what Peter is saying you and I ought to love people fervently. Have you ever had to work at loving people? Come on now. Y'all are with me, aren't you? There's some people it's easier to love them at a distance <laughs> rather than close up. But you and I are to love them fervently. It didn't, the Bible doesn't say just to love the sweet little angels dipped in sugar. <laughs> we are to love one another fervently in the house of God. And I can tell you it's wonderful to be in a church where people actually love one another and they show that love and I believe Vestavia is that kind of church and if and if and if you don't feel that way you need to get in here and help us <laughs> show us how to love one another right come on y'all let's love one another fervently there are people in our lives we have to work at loving them I understand that I get it I came from a large family, <laughs> as you all know, youngest of 15 kids, had a lot of cousins, I mean gobs of cousins. <laughs> I, was, I was an Uncle Sam the day I was born. I had nieces and nephews. Some of them easy to love. Some of them, like me, probably hard to love. <laughs> but I can tell you what, as time went on, the siblings began to love one another more and more and more. It's a beautiful thing to see siblings grow up and, and stop. You know, the only thing necessary for sibling rivalry is to have two children. <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing when children reach that point in life where the bickering stops. My, my two daughters, bless them, they loved one another, but boy, could they get into it. <laughs> Woo! Now, if they ever hear this tape, I'm not going to go any further, but <laughs> if you've had kids, you know how kids can be. I know how we were as kids. Today, my two daughters, thank God, are inseparable. They stand by each other. They're always helping one another, encouraging one another. That's the way we've got to be in the church. Now, if you're looking for a perfect church, good luck, because there aren't any. Church is where sinners ought to feel welcome to come. Is that not right? See, in, in church, <laughs> we're not saying that you've got to be perfect to join this church. No, we want people who are trying to live right to feel welcome here and come into this environment where they will be encouraged and strengthened to live right. And if you slip and slide and fall, which we all do, I want to say this. I believe the Christian life is a series of new beginnings. What do y'all say? Listen, I've been at it a long time. I'm 69 years old. I've been in the church since I was 15. My uncle told me at my ordination when I was 18 years old, my uncle Joe Bryan said, Sammy, 
He said, the hill you're climbing is a steep hill. And there's a lot of slick places. At 18, I didn't know what Uncle Joe was talking about. I was in my first love. The church was just full of sweet, loving people. I didn't know what Uncle Joe was talking about. A lot of slick places, he said. Well, I have found out. I didn't know much at 18. I would give a lot to know what I thought I knew at 18. (laughs) But I want to tell you, beloved friends, the church has been a salvation to me. It has. It has, I don't know where I would be today if it were not for the church and the love that I have felt. And the, and, and, and the, and I don't want to be in the church where everybody's going around with a, with a magnifying glass looking at everybody's sins. We don't want to do that. But we want to, we want to love one another with fervent charity among yourselves for charity shall what? Cover the multitude of sins. I love that. Saints sometimes just don't ever forget when somebody fails. They'll just bring it up and bring it up and bring it up over and over and over. You and I need to have good forgetters, don't we? We need to cover a multitude of sins. You know, when the Apostle Peter, who's writing this letter, was living with Jesus, he asked Jesus one day, he said, Lord, if somebody sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Seven times? And why is it we always think that somebody else is going to sin against me? What about me sinning against them? And I can honestly say I have offended people with my mouth a lot. And I've had to go to them and say, please forgive me. And thankfully, most people have been very forgiving. So Peter says, should I forgive seven times? He thought, that's, that's a lot of forgiving. And Jesus said, what about 70 times seven? That's 490 in one day. That blew Peter's mind, let me tell you. If you're going to be a good Christian, you're going to have to have a good forgetter. If you keep on a record, a score on people, and their failures and their shortcomings, it's going to rob you of your joy in the kingdom of God. Amen? So let's love one another with a fervent love and cover. Now, that doesn't mean we excuse sin. Listen, I want to tell you. When people do wrong, they're not going to learn from their mistakes if there are no consequences, right? There's consequences to us making bad choices. And the church sometimes has to discipline its members who are living outwardly sinful lives and bringing shame on the name of our Lord Jesus. But, beloved, you and I, as God's children, ought to be trying to cover a multitude of sins. And then let's come down to verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Hospitality is a big part of the Christian life. Did you know that? We were talking about that earlier today in the basement, about hospitality. See, in the first century, they didn't have Motel 6s. They didn't have Holiday Inns. They had some inns, but a lot of people couldn't afford them. They didn't have Chick-fil-A where you could go and get you a reasonable meal. These suffering saints scattered oftentimes needed a place to spend the night in their travels. And what if a Christian came to your door at midnight and knocked on your door and said, Could you give me refuge for the night? What is a Christian supposed to do? Open that door. And gladly receive them into your home. Nelda and I were blessed last night to have a young sister come and spend the night with us from North Carolina on her way to Montana. It was just a joy to have her in our home, Sister Hannah Allen. You rob yourself of a lot of blessings if you're not given to hospitality. And beloved, you don't have to serve a five-course meal Just put a hot dog on the grill. (laughs) And and if they're too good for a hot dog, you probably don't need them in your home anyway. Amen. (laughs) Now, if you want to have us over for a five-course meal, I'm up to it because eating is one of my gifts. (laughs) 
I'm not opposed to fancy meals, but let me t- most of the time you don't need a fancy meal to have company. The main thing is not the food, it's the fellowship, right? The company. Poor Martha got in a lot of trouble with Jesus when she wanted to serve a big fancy meal and wanted her sister to leave the feet of Jesus and come. So let's be given to hospitality. When I was a boy growing up, we lived 20, at least 25 miles from the nearest motel. So at our big meetings, we just had to take people in, and, and we loved it. We'd have 20, 25 people. Mama would put them on pallets all over. In those days, they would have cotton houses, you know, where the cotton was stored. People go out there and sleep on the cotton. And we had a wonderful time. May God help us all today to listen to the Apostle Peter. And and, and this text came to my mind heavily yesterday at the graduation. The rest of your time on this earth, whatever it is, let's live it to the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and died for us. May we have his mind. Thank you for your good attention. Do we have a selection? What number? What number?